The following presentation covers the returns of the United States Census from the year 1810. 1810 was the third census conducted by the United States government. In 1810, James Madison is the president. The United States constitutional government, which Madison had helped invent, has been functioning for 20 years. The country continues to expand westward. In 1803, Ohio became the 17th state to join the Union. Ohio joins the earlier states, Kentucky and Tennessee, as another trans-Appalachian state. A major event that had recently occurred was the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory west of the Mississippi River from France during President Jefferson's administration. This doubled the geographic area of the country and affirmed that the new nation was likely to be a major power in the future. Thus, the 1810 census marks a geographic turning point in American history, as the Appalachian Mountains, which had served as a major boundary to the English-speaking world for two centuries, has now essentially been crossed, settled, and brought into the Union. The 1810 census tabulated the number of free whites, other free persons, and slaves. Other free persons is recognized as generally revealing the number of free African Americans. The age and gender of free whites is accounted for in detail. The census is required to tabulate the distinction between free and slave residents in each state to compute the state's representation in Congress. In the original wording of the Constitution, slaves counted for three-fifths of a person for representation purposes, so it was necessary to distinguish the number of free and slave in the census. In the year 1810, the United States population was 7,239,881 an increase of 36% since the last census in 1800. The growth rate in this census is consistent with the growth rate in the preceding census. Incredibly, the population of the United States in 1810 is almost double that of a generation before during the first census in 1790. Any city in 1810 with more than a few thousand people would have been a major urban center, so the landscape would seem, by today's standards, very, very rural. A city of 10,000 people in 1810 would be among the largest in the nation. There are 4.3 people per square mile in 1810, meaning that if you walked in any direction for a mile, you would typically encounter a single household of four or five people. 6.7 million Americans, or about 93% of the population, lived in a rural environment. About half a million lived in a city environment. Virginia, the largest state, has 983,000 people in 1810. It's important to remember that Virginia in 1810 also includes modern West Virginia. New York State, the second largest state, is quickly catching up to Virginia's population. New York State is almost approaching 1 million residents in 1810, nearly doubling its population in 10 years. Pennsylvania has 810,000 residents in 1810. Massachusetts in 1810 is a large state by population and geography because Maine is part of Massachusetts at this time. Massachusetts has a total population of 701,000 with 472,000 in Massachusetts proper and 229,000 in the District of Maine. North Carolina is a robust southern state with 557,000 people. South Carolina has 415,000 people in 1810. Kentucky has rapidly developed into a large population by 1810 with 407,000 residents, that newer western state now larger than several of the old eastern states. Maryland had 381,000 residents in 1810. Connecticut is a little state with a large population of 262,000. Georgia, the state furthest south in 1810, has a population of 251,000. New Jersey has 246,000 residents in 1810, just larger than New Hampshire with 214,000. Tennessee claims 262,000 people at this time. The new state of Ohio, just seven years after her founding in 1803, has 231,000 souls in 1810. This illustrates how fast a new western state fills up in the 19th century. Vermont claims 218,000 residents in 1810. The two smallest states are Rhode Island with 77,000 souls, just larger than Delaware with 73,000. We will now look at cities. No cities in the United States have reached 100,000 residents by 1810, but New York City is close. New York City, 
like New York State as a whole, has jumped in size since the last census to 96,000 residents. New York City is not only the largest city in the country, it is almost twice as large as the next city. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the second largest city in the country with nearly 54,000 souls. However, the adjoining urban area of Northern Liberties Township adds another 20,000 to the greater Philadelphia area. Baltimore, Maryland has 47,000 people in 1810. Boston, Massachusetts has 34,000 residents. Just above Boston is Salem, Massachusetts with 13,000. Charleston, South Carolina remains the largest city in the South with 25,000 residents. New Orleans is unique in that it is one of the largest cities in the country, but it lies in the western territory of Orleans. There are 17,000 residents in New Orleans in 1810. The District of Columbia the greater Washington capital region, 10 years into its life, has 15,000 residents. Albany, New York has a population of 11,000 in 1810. So Albany, New York, a city with 11,000 people, is one of the largest cities in the country, a good example of how different population figures are at this time. The nation's borders and territorial regions are flashpoints in 1810. British Canada is to the north of the United States, with Fort Detroit of particular contention between the two nations. To the south is Spanish Florida, and the Great Lakes region are powerful Native American tribes that are banding together to push back American settlement. In the Indiana Territory, there is a great warrior uniting them, Tecumseh of the Shawnee. We can see that these three boundaries, Spain in the south, British Canada in the north, and Native America in the Great Lakes region, have set up the conditions for the conflict that will begin in 1812. We will zoom out for a wider view. The Mississippi River, just a generation ago considered the far west, is now the western boundary of the nation at Kentucky and Tennessee, and part of the western territories shown in purple. West of the river is Jefferson's recent Louisiana purchase in yellow, which doubled the nation's size. The modern state of Louisiana is in the Orleans Territory. The Lewis and Clark expedition occurred up the Missouri River in the decade before the 1810 census. So the United States is already aware of the Rocky Mountain region by this time and the route to the Pacific Ocean. So the infant nation born on the Atlantic coast is eyeing routes to the Pacific Ocean within its first generation of existence. The Mississippi River was home to old French settlements like New Orleans and St. Louis that are now, through Jefferson's purchase, part of the United States territory. Already by 1810, the United States has the ability to harness the great rivers of North America into a grand transcontinental waterway. The Ohio River begins at Pittsburgh here, flowing down through the Midwest, where it on-ramps to the Mississippi River and then down to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic trade. Meanwhile, the western route up the Missouri River has been explored with the future design to reach the Pacific Ocean. Americans in 1810 are thinking continentally. We will zoom back into the eastern half of the continent. In the southwest is the Mississippi Territory, the future states of Mississippi and Alabama. The Mississippi Territory is bordered by Spanish Florida to the south, the Mississippi River to the west, Tennessee to the north, and Georgia to the east. The future state of Mississippi has some 31,000 residents. In the modern state of Alabama, there are some 9,000 residents in 1810. West of the Mississippi River lies the Orleans Territory, which is modern Louisiana. This has a very large territorial population of 77,000. It's important to remember that New Orleans and the lower Mississippi had previously been French ports for a century by this time, and that accounts for the high population figures in modern Louisiana. The Orleans Territory in 1810 is almost ready to become the formal state of Louisiana. Above the Orleans Territory is the Louisiana Territory in blue. In future Arkansas in the Louisiana Territory, there are 1,000 intrepid settlers. Moving up the Mississippi River on the western side is the future state of Missouri. This part of the Louisiana Territory claims 20,000 residents. St. Louis had been a French trading post for generations by this time, so there is already an established European population there. In the north, the Northwestern Territories in blue are the future Great Lakes states. 
Ohio has already been added to the Union, but the future states of Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin are a flashpoint between American settlers, Native Americans, and British Canadians. It's important to remember with these territories that Native Americans, unless they are part of the taxed citizenry, are not included in the Western population figures. In 1810, from the perspective of the United States government, untaxed Native Americans are seen as foreigners, not citizens of the United States. Indiana Territory is home to 25,000 American settlers in 1810, the largest population in the Northwest Territories. Further west in the Illinois Territory, the United States claims 12,000 residents. Michigan, the far north, has some 5,000 pioneers in 1810. In addition to total populations, the census was mandated to tabulate slave populations because slaves, in the original wording of the Constitution, were counted as three-fifths of a person in the enumeration of state representation. At this time, there are some 1.4 million African Americans in the country, with about 1.2 million enslaved. Thus, the vast majority of African Americans in the United States in 1810 were slaves, but some 186,000 were freemen. About 17% of the entire United States population was enslaved in 1810. Massachusetts and its District of Maine have no slaves in 1810, there are 7,700 free African Americans in Massachusetts and the District of Maine. Likewise, New Hampshire and Vermont have no slaves in 1810. Rhode Island has nearly abolished slavery with 108 slaves remaining in that state. There were 3,600 free African Americans in Rhode Island. Connecticut had nearly ended slavery by 1810. There are 310 slaves in Connecticut that state reducing slavery by two-thirds in 10 years. There were 6,500 free African Americans in Connecticut. New York State had 15,000 slaves in 1810, or 1.6% of the population. The presence of 15,000 slaves in New York State is a 25% reduction in slavery since the previous census. New York still has a larger number of free African Americans than slaves, with 25,000 freemen. New Jersey had nearly 11,000 slaves in 1810, or about 4% of the population. There were 7,900 freemen in New Jersey. The 1810 census is the last census that New Jersey will have more slaves than free African Americans. Pennsylvania has nearly abolished slavery by 1810. There are 800 slaves in the state of 810,000 people, meaning about 1 in 1,000 people were slaves. There were 22,500 free African Americans in Pennsylvania. The new northwestern state, Ohio, has zero slaves in 1810. Ohio, as dictated by the Northwest Ordinance, is the first state founded in the United States as a free state from its origin. There are 1,900 free African Americans in Ohio. Northern states had either abolished or were in the process of abolishing slavery. However, in the South, Eli Whitney's cotton gin had made cotton production much more widespread and slavery becomes reinforced. The Upper South, like Virginia, Maryland, and Kentucky, are tobacco states, whereas further south in states like South Carolina and Georgia, cotton is emerging as a dominant crop. Maryland had 111,500 slaves in 1810, about 29% of its population. An interesting feature of Upper South States is the presence of many slaves and also a large free African American population. In 1810, there were 34,000 free African Americans in Maryland, so about one in four African Americans in Maryland were free men. Whereas Maryland will have a large number of slaves, her neighbor Delaware is moving toward fewer slaves. In 1810, Delaware has 4,200 slaves, half the number of slaves from a generation previous during the 1790 census. About 6% of the population of Delaware is enslaved, so Delaware's rate of slavery is closer to New Jersey than a cash crop state like Maryland or Virginia. Delaware has 13,100 freemen in 1810. The nation's capital district, the District of Columbia, had 3,500 slaves in 1810 
about one in four residents in the District of Columbia were slaves. Kentucky had 80,500 slaves, or about 20% of its population. Kentucky has many slaves, but the percentage of slaves here is about half that of cash crop states. Virginia, the most populous state, had 394,000 slaves in 1810, the most of any state in the Union. 40% of Virginia's population was enslaved at this time. We see a glaring distinction between the western counties of Virginia, the future West Virginia, and Eastern Virginia. Eastern Virginia has been tobacco growing country for two centuries by 1810. Eastern Virginia had 383,500 slaves, while the western part of Virginia had 11,000 slaves. In Eastern Virginia, slaves represented 44% of the population, while that number decreased to 10% of the population in the future West Virginia. Virginia had 31,500 free African Americans in 1810. Tennessee had 44,500 slaves in 1810, about 17% of the population. Tennessee, Virginia, and Maryland are showing the same pattern. The low, flat lands have plantations with slaves. However, the Appalachian regions of these states have very few slaves. Eastern Tennessee in the Appalachian Mountains, like Western Virginia and Western Maryland, had much lower rates of slavery than the low-lying areas. North Carolina had 169 slaves in 1810, about 30% of the population. There were 10,300 free African Americans in North Carolina. South Carolina had 196,000 slaves in 1810, about 47% of the state. South Carolina is emerging in the Cotton Age as a state with the highest percentage of slaves. Interestingly, in a state where nearly half the population is enslaved, there are also some 4,500 free African Americans in South Carolina. Georgia had 105,000 slaves in 1810, about 42% of its population. Moving out west to the territories, in the future state of Alabama in the Mississippi Territory, there were some 2,600 slaves, or 29% of the population. In the western portion of the Mississippi Territory, in the future state of Mississippi, there were some 14,500 slaves, or about 46% of its population. The growth of slavery in the Mississippi Territory is exponential, a result of the expansion of cotton plantations. Beyond the Mississippi River, in the future state of Louisiana, in the Orleans Territory, there are some 35,000 slaves, or 45% of the population there. Moving up the west side of the Mississippi River into the Louisiana Purchase Territory, to the future state of Arkansas, there are 136 slaves in this sparsely settled region. Above Arkansas, in the region that will become the future state of Missouri, there are 2,900 slaves in 1810, or about 15% of the population. Missouri is too far north to be a cotton state, so the slave population will remain lower as compared to other slave states. While the Northwest Territory laws forbid slavery north of the Ohio River, those laws are hard to enforce in 1810. Likely what has happened is settler families coming from cash crop states have brought their slaves to the territories here. However, most of the African American population in the Northwest Territories were freemen in 1810. In the Indiana Territory, there were 237 slaves, or about 1% of the population. There are nearly twice as many free African Americans in the Indiana Territory as enslaved African Americans. Similarly, in the Illinois Territory, there were 168 slaves, or about 1% of the population. However, there are three times as many free African Americans in the Illinois Territory at this time. Michigan Territory had 24 slaves and 120 freemen. In 1810, the United States is a rapidly growing nation, and her boundaries are expanding quickly across the North American continent. However, the new nation will have to contend with Spain to the south, Britain to the north, and Native America to the west.